Hello and welcome again. We're here at the ABA Annual Conference in San Francisco. I'm Joe Patrice from Above the Law and the Legal Talk Network show, Thinking Like a Lawyer. I'm Gilman Louie from Ossip Louie Partners, a venture capital firm. I'm Mark Rotenberg with the Electronic Privacy Information Center in Washington, D.C. I'm Harvey Rishikoff from Kroll & Mooring, and I'm the chair of the advisory committee for the Standing Committee on Law and National Security. And this is another edition of On the Road with the Legal Talk Network. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for another one of these reports from the convention. Um, I suppose this is a testament to some form of technology that you might not be hearing the jazz quartet that's playing behind us. If you aren't, you're missing out. Uh, but I can assure you they're pretty good. And today, though, we're going to talk about different kinds of technology, and we're going to talk about basically everything that's, uh, that's out to get us in the world, I think. Uh, I think is probably the way to put it. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about emerging issues in basically law enforcement and national security. So. You all had a panel earlier today. Um, I unfortunately wasn't able to go because I was recording another show. So what, uh, what came up in this panel today? Well, I was interested to hear the FBI director uh, talk about the problems he's encountering with encryption, which certainly makes it more difficult for law enforcement agencies to get access to evidence. But on the other side, there's a real concern that consumers and users of new technology have to make sure that their personal stuff is protected. And from the privacy perspective, I actually think on balance, it's better to have strong encryption than weak encryption. I'm sympathetic to the FBI director's position, but there are an awful lot of people in the United States with cell phones, a lot of very sensitive information on those devices. Yeah, and it's an issue that comes up a lot is the law enforcement interest in a backdoor to things, but I just, I, I assume you're kind of on the side that that is going to be a way worse for the hackers than it is for uh, like I think the it, FBI. I think it's going to be way, way worse. And one of the other points that came up during our panel discussion was that we're no longer just talking about privacy and surveillance with digital networks. We're talking about the Internet of Things and networks that control our cars and our homes and our devices. And you really want that stuff to be secure because if that stuff becomes vulnerable, to attack about by others. It's not just the loss of privacy, but it's uh, it's public safety. I think the other topic that came up uh, was that the law enforcement agencies have many more tools today than they had 10 or 15 years ago, simply because of the digital exhaust. Yes, there are challenges of reading encrypted messages, but it's very hard to operate without a digital footprint. Your credit cards, where you've been, the the tolls that you cross with your you know instant pay on your cars, um, data is all around us. Uh, and now the question is, how does law enforcement use that data? What's the rules of governance around the use of that data, um, and the use of the compute that's necessary to actually crunch that information? I guess part of the issue is first, where is the attack coming from? So we usually use the acronym CHU. You have criminals, you have hacktivists, there's espionage, and then there's war. And trying to delineate those different statutory regimes is complicated for the space. And we're looking at what that means vis-a-vis -a, -vis a Title 10, which is usually the military's authority, versus Title 18, which is criminal authority, versus Title 50, which is uh, espionage or the world of um, spying and as was pointed out um, all of these particular actors use this space and that's what makes it particularly complicated. Well and it would seem like one of the challenges of modern warfare as a whole is that a lot of things can bleed between those different categories. You could characterize someone you're at war with as this is an espionage issue or this is a criminal issue and making it a lot harder. Is there any interest that you've found in government to try and streamline these issues, or are we just gonna let it go with a bunch of competing? Well, I actually think what's so interesting about this area is that the issues are getting more complex. I mean, we planned this uh, program several months ago, and just in the last few weeks, we learned about things like the DNC hack, 
likely involving Russia, right? So now suddenly you've got one government using the internet trying to upset electoral politics in another country. That's a really big deal. And you have to kind of put that on your list of what do I do about that problem while you're working the other problems. Which gets to you know things like technical issues like attribution. If you get attribution wrong in your cyber analysis, not knowing who that attacker and why they were attacking you, or having an attacker pose as a different class of attacker, becomes a very complex issue. And at the moment of the attack, you don't know, because it takes time to do the forensics, who's doing it and the reasons behind it. So figuring out which area of law that you have the right to act on um, becomes very complex and very naughty. So I would say that we've had a number of game changers that Mark and Gilman have alluded to. So uh, the first game changer was the Stuxnet incident, whoever was responsible for that, with the destruction of the centrifuges. That helped erase the notion of the virtual world and the physical world. Then we had the attack on Sony, in which we uh, had a nation state going after, which is allegedly a nation state, but trying to suppress speech and actually destroying data. And as Mark alluded to, now we have the attack on the DNC and the releasing of information with the intent to try to influence American politics. Well, that is a world all in cyber, all doing things, all with us trying to figure out what's the appropriate classification, who's the appropriate aggressor, and what's the appropriate response. Yeah, I mean, it, as somebody whose understanding of technology is limited largely to watching movies in which somebody types for a while and then something happens, it, it, it's interesting that you say that you're talking about how hard it is to figure out exactly where the attacks are coming from, that people are bouncing things off of everywhere, and that that which seems very fanciful in whatever Mission Impossible movie it is, is really real, that people can kind of obscure where the attack is coming from. It's actually a classic plot line in a James Bond movie. <laughs> you see, if you want to get the US and Russia in a conflict, and you're a bad guy without much political power, you make one superpower think that the other yeah. superpower is the source of the attack. And it's actually true that with cyber attack, attribution is a really hard problem. And people know this, so they have to be careful, even when they're under attack, that they not misattribute the source of the attack, because that can turn out to be even worse than what they're dealing with at the moment. Yeah, that's why a lot of us are very cautious around commercial enterprises or organizations who try to use offensive means to respond to an attack because it's very easy to get wrong. And so, I mean, th these are technically very tricky, challenging issues um, that cannot be simply written off as, oh, you saw it on 24 or you saw it in a James Bond movie, we must therefore have it. We have a joke in the U.S. intelligence agencies of the guy who goes to a Mission Impossible movie who's laughing is usually the dead ringer for the guy who actually works in the intelligence service because <laughs> we all wish we had that stuff they have in Hollywood. <laughs> Make a thought experiment. So you have two ends of the spectrum. One end of the spectrum, when we started this space, it was very hard to have any effective, authoritative attribution. At the other end of the space, when you look at someone who's in the military, we are tagging their ability to get onto the machine. The machine is tagged, and all the data eventually could potentially be tagged. So there'd be no anonymity. And anyone's involvement would immediately be held accountable. And those are the two worldviews. And the question is, what is the policy and social consequences that flow from those two worldviews? A world where you can hide, and a world where you will never be able to hide. And the consequences are really long. I mean, I think one of the challenges is everybody tends to talk about cybersecurity as a U.S. domestic problem. You know, the, the internet, as we were saying on, on the panel, is a global resource. Uh, one capability that may help one country or one government may actually work against that government because another government may misuse that or another foreign power may misuse that. So this is not what is good for America is good for the rest of the world situation. This is a hard problem. So I would say that when we started the ABA 
a national cyber law task force with Judy Miller and myself. We divided the world up into three buckets. One bucket was the role of the law firm and how law firms have to play this space. The second bucket was critical infrastructure. So we have 16 critical infrastructures that has a, both a public-private relationship in which the government is with the private sector is trying to protect and the recent attack in the Crimean that took down that infrastructure, a uh, high-tech scared us. And the third bucket, which uh, Gilman has been alluding to, was the idea of the international bucket. What should be the international cyber norms? How do you create them? How do you enforce them? Is a major debate going on at the international, in the international arena. Yeah, well, um, this is calling out, sort of. So, while we've been talking here, Mark's been catching Pokemon. Uh, not really, though, but we did have a Pokemon moment. And this is, this is a worldwide phenomenon right now that people are starting to get hacked through. Uh, I know You they, may want to have Gilman speak to the Pokemon issue because <laughs> he has a certain elective affinity to that issue that he may want to describe. Well, mainly because I'm on the board of Niantic and uh, with the <laughs> you guys have had a good week. <laughs> investors in, the, in Pokemon Go. Uh, you know, the, the issue of a game or any game or things that you do in everyday life, right? basically is putting your footprint out there into the cloud and the ability to protect that, for companies to protect that, to secure it, to make sure it's not mishandled, is a real one. So this is not just a, a debate of whether or not encryption should have backdoors in to help law enforcement, but the dangers of allowing weak crypto to protect fundamental security, like where your kids are at any moment in time and protecting them from predators. I mean, it's a real issue. I, mean, I, I will say, so far, at least in my experience, Google has been amazingly on top of it. Like, I've had a couple of alerts saying somebody tried to do something and they'd shut it down. But I know it was, it was all worth it because I managed to get, you know, I managed to evolve that Krabby into a king. But still, it was, it's a thing that's out there. And, yeah, it's, a, it's been pretty big this last uh, couple of weeks. So we're, congratulations. We're fortunate to have Google's infrastructure be able to protect, you know, this mm -hmm. game. But not all companies have the resources of Google. Yeah. So that's right? raised an interesting question because we get very concerned when the government is going to be doing censorship, but we seem to be a little bit more lax when it's the private sector, given its social private sense of responsibility, using the power of its algorithms, doing machine to machine analysis, taking down posts in social media. Yeah. Well, that's a new interesting phenomena that social media is going to have to think through. As Gimlin is saying, who will be held responsible if you should have that capability and you're not taking that capability and people are hurt, that may be an interesting potential form of liability that will be emerging in the space. So let me just drop a phrase here. One of our big campaigns right now is algorithmic transparency. And what we're arguing for is the idea that when there's a computer-based decision about an individual, it may be employment, it may be credit related, it may be the ad that you see on your web browser, we think people should know the basis of that decision. Which factors were taken into account? You know, was race a factor, for example? Yeah. It's really interesting. I mean, we have a good tradition in this country of pushing back against discrimination against people, and we have ways in the physical world to identify it and, you know, debate it and litigate it. But when it's encoded, it's very difficult to detect. And as more decisions are made through algorithmic processes, we think there's a greater need for openness and accountability. So we may start having uh, algorithmic inspector generals. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm right. completely in favor. Well, you know, in, in the old way of programming a computer where you basically have a rule, if A, then B, it was relatively straightforward. But with new algorithms where you have machine learning who may not, from the programmer's point of view, was designed to take race into consideration, but the algorithm arrives to that conclusion, you know, that has huge social impact. Right, so let me pick up on that. That's a really interesting point that Gilman just made. When we started pushing the algorithmic transparency theme, people came back to us and they said, well, it's actually much more complex. We have machine-based learning. We don't fully understand 
the basis of the decisions. It would be almost impossible for us to sort it out. And I said, well, that's kind of interesting to think about, isn't it? I mean, when you've become dependent on a process that you no longer fully understand, that's something I think we need to drill down So, on. as always, these guys are, like, right on point. Because one of the under things is there's a theoretician named Latani Sweeney who's been working with the FTC about the inherent bias potential. So you may not be able to figure out, but you'll see the consequence. And that consequence then will lead you to say, we have to unpack these numbers because we're getting certain outcomes that when you looked at it randomly, you shouldn't get because it's self-learning, which is quite fascinating. So we used to say in the law, it's a, it's a discrimination by impact, yes. right? And that's what you're looking at is the impact of those particular algorithms. But that's because the math is based on correlations not causation. And yeah. so letting these algorithms run is even more dangerous than the traditional old form of redlining. Because redlining is a handful of people basically decide whether or not they're going to sell you a piece of property or not. While a computer can make that decision millions of times a second. So the consequence of getting it wrong is much greater than in the old school physical world. So this is not to geek out, but yeah. you know, Gilman's point about causation versus correlation is critical. Because in social science, when I was in graduate school, you only became successful if you could show the causation of variable A to variable B. But in public policy, if you're able to know that these five or six variables are co-varying, and you know it has a certain impact, you don't care which is the critical variable, you just look at those four or five covariants and that explains the outcome. So yep. that was the theory of the exploding manhole covers in Manhattan. And what they realized was there were about seven or eight variables that would explain why a manhole would explode. They didn't know why, what the relationship was, but when they, any manhole analysis, those seven or eight, they just went and they didn't, dealt with all the variables as opposed to just one. And that became sort of a good public policy output, but from the idea of causation, not a good causation output. Yeah. So we need to worry less about the Terminators and be more worried that Skynet's going to be really, really racist. Well, it's all around uh, us. Yeah. I mean, it's all around us because it's in the algorithms that determine everything in our everyday lives. And as we put more compute everywhere, those algorithms become much more impactful in our daily lives. Well, just keep in mind that great scene from 2001, how open the pod bay door. I'm sorry, I can't do that, Dave. Yeah. As we say, the ethics of computer logic. Yeah. It's going to be a great new legal area. Yeah. And the interesting thing about that, of course, was that in 2001, they didn't necessarily get into it, but like if you read the book or whatever, they, that Hal was doing that because that was actually fulfilling his long-term mission was to do that, and that was what was scary. He'd figured out it was actually better to kill them to do his mission, and that hadn't been accounted well, for. As you know, in the Foundation series, it's all about probability theory. <laughs> I love how this entire conversation has now gotten deep into Arthur Clarke and Asimov. <laughs> yeah, so, of course, feeling it, we've had Terminator references. I'm glad. I'm, Laws but, of robotics. We yeah, don't talk about that. Let's but, just yeah, yeah. But the body, we should it, mention the Supreme Court at one point. This right? goes back to the body <laughs> of law, in that if law takes years to execute, and technology is iterating every eighteen months, right? It is extremely difficult for law, and policy, and and regulatory environments to keep up with this acceleration of technological breakthroughs that we're dependent on every day. Well, and to your point a second ago, the Supreme Court is not exactly the most tech-savvy entity in the universe. I don't well, think. I think we're going to wait for the next degree of appointments mm -hmm. that we'll get. It's a generational issue. So, ironically now, we don't have anyone on the court who actually has served in the military as a full-time military uh, officer for the first time since 1945. Yeah. It's generational code. So the big question is, when will being able to code a requirement to sit on the court? Yeah. And by the time it does, it will we'll probably be past that. Uh, <laughs> yep. It'll be fully machine learning, yeah. how to code. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, th this is amazingly fascinating stuff. Thank you, everybody, for coming here to walk through this with us. Uh, if you at home have enjoyed this, you should give us a rating and uh, like us on iTunes. It allows their 
completely black box algorithm to figure out whether or not we are relevant enough for you to listen to. And now by merely saying that, I'm sure we've been banned by iTunes. But come on back for another edition of On the Road with Legal Talk Network coming soon. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find us on Twitter and Facebook. Or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Thank you.